Uh, Brother Nathaniel, Psalm chapter number 63 and verse number 1. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. So David had a desire. That is a psalm of David. David had a longing in his heart. David had a desire. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, neighbor. David had a desire. Brother Jesse, Isaiah chapter number 44 and verse number 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Do y'all believe that? I believe we're experiencing that. I sure do. Let's stand for the reading of our golden text. The reading of our golden text, the selected scriptures. The inspiration for this morning's service. John chapter number 7, verses number 37 through 39. If you have it, say amen. amen. In the last day, make a mental note of that in the sermon. You will hear me put an emphasis on that fact. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. What a sight. And while crying, he said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Do you think you might have had the prophet Isaiah in mind? Do you think you might have had the prophet David, that man of God, the sweet psalmist, the beloved of Israel in mind? If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And our grand finale this morning will be an emphasis on verse number 39. May we pray, Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you so much for the ability to come to the house of the Lord, for enabling us and giving us what we need to be able to make our way here. I thank you for the assembling of these people together to hear your word. I pray that you would help me to do what you've called me to do, anoint me, set a watch or a guard at my mouth and help me to say only the things you would have me to say, nothing more or less. Anoint the ears of this thy people that they might hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches through this preached word, through this blessed word of God, not through my words, God, but through your words, I pray. Preach through me, O Holy Ghost. And I pray that we would not hear only, but we would heed. Help us to not depart this place sorrowfully, but joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're being seated, say, hey, neighbor. Hey. Have you seen the golden picture? Hey, neighbor, have you seen the golden picture? Our text is found in a New Testament book of the Holy Bible. The title bears the name of its writing's author. This book of the Bible is one of four Gospels. The Bible readers among us today can tell us the name of the four Gospels, and they are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three that you just named are known as the Synoptic Gospels, and John's Gospel stands alone or apart from the Synoptic Gospels. So the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, The first three that you just named are the synoptic gospels. But I want you to know that John's gospel is very different. Why is it different, Pastor? Thank you for asking because I would like to share with you why it is different. And during this message this morning, I would also like to share with you why David was blessed in the manner that he was blessed and why the prophet Isaiah was blessed in the manner that he was blessed because of their great desire. How could you have four Gospels that are inspired by the Holy Ghost and the authors of those four Gospels were no doubt moved on by the Spirit of God and put pen to parchment and wrote the very words of God, but somehow even the Gospel of John stands out from the other Gospels. Those of you that know something about the 66 books of the Bible, you know that every word Every punctuation, the commas, 
the semicolons, the colons, everything's in their own purpose. It's God breathed. This is the word of God. And that's why we were told not to revise it, not to change it, not to add to it or take away from it. So how come people recognize that John's gospel was so different that we would put Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel into its own category and we put it in a file and stamp it synoptic gospels and then over here in a separate manila envelope, we'll put the gospel of John and say, this stands alone. This stands aside from the others. This is a little bit different. If you'll think with me concerning the character John in the word of God, you will notice that the Bible says that he was one of three. And even though he was one of three, he was one of one. There was something very special about this man, John. And I hope to prove to you this morning that it was because of the desire that he had in his heart for the Lord. This man, Brother Samuel Sterrett, had a desire to be close to Jesus we feel like he was one that always wanted to be standing right beside the master. This is why I appreciate people that like to go to church. Those that refuse to forsake the assembling of themselves together with the believers. It just seems to me like people that love God would love to be in a place wherever that geographic location is where it has been designated or set aside from other venues and places, structures, and buildings where the people of God would gather together. I believe if John was alive today, that John would be frequenting the place where the believers are gathered together. People say, well, can't we have church just anywhere? I know that you can get in the presence of the Lord just about anywhere, for he's just as close as the mention of his name. But he encouraged the gathering together of believers when he gave us the scripture. If two or three of you will agree, he also said, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst. Why didn't he just say, hey, if one of you are walking alone, he was encouraging us coming together and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But sometimes, Sister Wooten, even though we have that togetherness, and I thank God for the togetherness of the Bethel Holiness Church, probably nearly 70 of you all this morning, and I realize you are a unified or close-knit group of people that God has somehow intertwined y'all's lives. He's brought you from various places in these beautiful United States of America. You are people of like-mindedness. You are people of like precious faith. You are people of similar purpose. And you have similar goals and objectives, but somehow all of these disciples of Jesus Christ were the same kind of people. I mean, Jesus selected 12 to be his apostles, those that walked around with him during his three and a half years of ministry. They were very instrumental in his life. They supported him. They ministered to him. They were very valuable, including the notorious infamous Judas. Jesus saw some wonderful things about him. I mean, Judas got appointed over the treasury of the Lord's ministry. But what was it about John? And I want us to soul search here this morning and look at our own lives and see, do we have a desire? There's people in this building that are now recipients of salvation that will admit when God first flung the craving on them for him, they replied when the Spirit drawed them, they came to the Father's house and knelt down at an old-fashioned altar of repentance and the old creature became a new creature to the glory of God. There are people in this building this morning that will say, I ask God to forgive me because I did not love people the way I should love people and I turned loose of it. I would not hold on to the fact that I hated people. I repented of it and turned away from it. You can ask God to do something for you for 20 to 30, even 50 years. And if you're not willing to turn loose of it, you're just never going to get free from it. And that's what a lot of people are doing. They want to be saved in their sin. They don't want to be saved from their sin. I know that when I came to the altar nearly 
30 years ago, I meant business in the words of Sister Iris Swoop. I was done with my old lifestyle. I remember telling the Lord that morning, I feel your spirit drawing me. You're working on that end, and I'm going to reciprocate. I'm going to come to you. And I believe that the Lord met me at the altar. But Brother Jesse, the thing that I told the Lord was this. I am sick and tired of the way I'm living. And as soon as I said that, I'd done something I had not done in a long time. I cried, literally melted into the floor and fell to my knees and was born again. Old desires were replaced with new desires. I thank God for the desire that he put in my heart to get out of bed this morning, to wake up early, and to finish preparing for tonight's, to this morning service, even though we had been in church up until 10 o'clock last night. I feel like John was this kind of man that could say, there's just something going on inside of me that I cannot explain. I'm not looking for an opportunity to get away from the people of God. I'm not looking for somebody to say something that upsets me so I could walk away. You will remember that Peter was given an opportunity to walk away because Jesus knew what he was bringing these men into. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, just go ahead and go. He told the other guys, just go ahead and go. And Peter spearheaded this effort of keeping everything together. And he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So we know that Peter had a desire to be in the presence of Jesus. He didn't want to be anywhere else. This guy had a successful commercial fishing business. He loved he loved the fish. He loved the people. He's got a family. We find where Jesus prayed for his mother-in-law. He's pulled in all types of directions, but his preeminent desire, his most important passion is to have something scratched here. He needs Jesus to be in his life. But even though Peter is such a man as this, how does John stand out beyond Peter and Peter's commitment and dedication? I feel like Brother Samuel that John realized that he could pull strength from this source of power that was available at his fingertips. He realized this is a blessing that has been given to me and I'm not going to let go of it. If you look at Sister Wooten and some of the other elder sisters in this church, you will know that any time the Spirit of God moves, she refuses to let that pass her by where she is untouched by that Spirit of God. She moves quickly into that flow, if you would, into that river where the Spirit of God is moving. She's got a desire for it. Sometimes I see the Spirit of God moving the way that it is. And I can tell not everybody in the building has the same desire that John had, David had, Isaiah had, or Sister Wooten had, or Pastor has for a move of God or for an experience with Jesus. Now, if you're having a problem thinking about Peter and his commitment and his dedication and Judas and his shortcomings and his failures, your heart is not in the right place. There should never be a time that any child of God says, I backslid because of the behavior of somebody else or their lack of commitment. They gave me a desire to do something else other than be with Jesus. But we find that John, he's not worried about what Peter's doing. He's not worried about what Judas is doing. But he's worried about John getting everything that he needs to get. And we find that this man is laid up against the chest of Jesus. He's wanting to tap in and get some strength from that mighty source of power. John must not begin his writings by focusing on the 
earthly ministry of Jesus. All the other us, the authors of the other gospels began their gospels focused on the public ministry. But John's fascination was bigger than the moment. He goes and starts us in the beginning. He knew who Jesus was. That's what sets his gospel apart or aside from others he is. John loves him for who he really is. I'm talking to somebody in this building this morning. When revival comes, you shouldn't get a passion for church. When revival comes, you shouldn't get a desire for the better things of God. When it becomes public, it's not time to get fascinated. John was fascinated from the beginning. When the author put the pen to the parchment, John was fascinated. And whenever he took the pen and made his last punctuation mark, John was on the Isle of Patmos and he was writing until it is finished. Somebody that's fascinated for the moment is only in it for the moment. It's like, oh man, they're serving Krispy Kremes up the road at the Handy now. Now, we're going to go get Krispy Kreme. But the person that's really got the desire is the one that makes that 45 minute trek from here over there to Cleveland Avenue on the western side of Fort Myers and walks in there and says, I've been thinking about this all morning. I've been thinking about this for the last six weeks. I've been thinking about this for the last six months or six years. It's always on my mind. You see, John was not only focused on who he was holding, the public ministry of the God man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but no, John wants to introduce us to his king, who is king of kings and lord of lords. He introduced is him, huh? Jesus Christ as deity, huh? the triune member of the Godhead. Huh? He seems that John huh? is trying to draw water huh? out of an eternal fountain. Huh? He realizes this ministry huh? is short huh? and his days are few, huh? but there's more to this huh? than what meets the eye, huh? and I want to get every bit of it I can. Yeah. Huh? John chapter number 13 and verse number 23 said, Now there was one that was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Don't you think he loved all of them? All of them were chosen, and even one of them decided to become a devil. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples the context of this incident is Jesus has his chosen ones and they are eating supper. And as we read of this gathering together of the believers, of the followers, the focus shifts to three characters. The Lord, John, and Judas. But everybody in the building looks the same. Everybody's dressed for supper. Everybody's got an appetite. Everybody's ready for a little unleavened bread. Everybody's ready to partake or they wouldn't have even come to the supper. But we see that the focus gets narrower and we look upon John and we realize that this man realizes that Jesus has given eternal life giving water and the other is the betrayer and come on now and the other is the one that pins the book of Revelation while the other is the son of perdition whom Satan has entered it's troubling for me to realize there can be people in the middle of a local church. There can be people in the midst of a wonderful revival. There can be people literally eating from the hands of Jesus and be allowing the devil to impurse. Come on now to indwell in their person. Don't you be one that goes to church and allows the devil to do more than sit on that pew. Don't you allow the devil to come in your mind. Don't you let him come in that heart. You better kick the devil out. Raise your hands and love on Jesus. At this point, Sister Wooten, everybody 
is chosen. At this point, Jesus has to say, all of you are chosen, but one of you is a devil. At this point, everyone's present at roll call. I don't know who came in late. I don't know who came in early. I know that probably John was probably the first one there to make sure he got a special seat, Brother Jacob. And his special seat was one. I've got to be right there by the pastor. Anybody that knows Brother Rick Jacob knows that on my left, there's a seat that is always open to him. And I may or may not ask you to remove yourself. Most of the time I will prevent you from sitting down because I like his spirit. Hey, this world is hard enough on people. I like his cool, calm, collected self being right beside me. So I call him my left-hand man. And the seat on my right is usually designated for my wife or my bride. And most people don't try to intrude on that. And I'm not saying guys when all the guys are sitting together just leave that open for her to come over and sit down she won't I'm trying to tell you that John was obviously seated in a very special seat so yes everybody's chosen, chosen and everybody is special but there's something very special about John I don't know why God said Esau have I hated but Jacob have I loved I think this morning, I'm helping you understand that it has a, a lot to do with, with re, 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 reciprocity. Say it. Reciprocity. Reciprocation. I think it has a lot to do with, hey, this guy right here is fascinated with me. I'm coming in here to have supper. The time of my departure is at hand. And I look and right here on my left, ready to eat, seemingly, but really ready to be right by my side. Ready to stand. I'm so ready. I'm ready for this to get on. I'm ready for this to go. And you will remember he was so close to Jesus. There's an intimacy there. Not a homosexuality, but there's an intimacy. I believe the Holy Ghost is helping you understand this morning huh, the importance of uh, having an ache in your heart and a longing in your heart for what it is uh, God wants you to have huh. God can hold huh, the promise in front of you huh, but you should not expect him to dangle the carrot huh, in front of you every day huh. whether the carrot's there huh, or not huh, you're going to go to the will of God huh. I said John was there huh, in his rightful place huh, whether there was a good service or not huh, he had a desire for the fire. I think he said unleavened bread. That's good. That's great. Okay. Some uh, wine. That's good. That's great. But when Jesus sat down. Okay, now we're talking. And you will remember this friendship. This close proximity that John maintains with Jesus. Others of the disciples begin to envy it and they get jealous of it. Come on now, I've had this for several days. I dealt with a spirit of jealousy last night and it is what I said it is. It's as cruel as the grave. And you can see that it even tried to get the other disciples of Jesus. And one time Jesus heard Peter say to him, he said, Jesus, why is John getting a special treatment? Why does he get a red carpet rolled out to the seat right beside you? How come you're telling me I'm going to be martyred and my blood's going to be shed? But John, he might tarry until you come. And Jesus said, whatever I've said to you, I've said it. And he said, what is it to you about my plan? What he said is, we're not even going to go there. Because sometimes when you're going out to fish and you should be standing on the shore waiting on me, you're leading other the disciples out of church. That's what the Bible said, Peter looked at them and said I'll go a fishing. I guarantee you John wasn't looking for an opportunity to go fishing. He was looking for the fisher of me and Jesus Christ. If you're looking for a fish, you'll find it. If you're looking for a way out of church, you'll find it. But if you're looking for Jesus and looking for an opportunity to hear from God and to get victory in your life, you will find it. Feel the Holy Ghost in this place. So we realize, Brother Jesse, everybody has the same opportunity, but not everybody has the same desire. That's very good. That's very deep. Why did they get the Holy Ghost? You heard Brother Jesse say last night while preaching 
He said our pastor used words of wisdom. It's at the beginning of his message. And he said, I went from being disinterested in the spiritual things in church. He said, I enjoyed being with everybody. I love church. I didn't miss services. He's given his testimony several times. He said, I love singing. I was saved. I was sanctified. I was living without sin for the most part. He said, when I did sin, I'd ask God to forgive me. I just love being a Christian. He said, but I did not have a desire for this river of living water. I had a disinterest for the Holy Ghost. It was good to see other people get it. I was not offended by it. I shook my head and I smiled and said, amen, praise the Lord. Ain't that wonderful, Sister Howell is shouting again. Ain't that great? Sister Candace got the Holy Ghost. And Jesse said, but you know, I never felt like it was for me. I had no desire for it. But he said, when our pastor said, let's pray for Brother Nathaniel and Sister Rachel and the girls that have been battling sickness. And when our pastor said, I need spiritual people to come here at this moment and pray with me. Jesse said that resonated with me. When he said the word spiritual, it was like it left up in the air. It began in the flash so boldly spiritual that's what Jesus is looking for he's looking for a child that will sit by his side until something happens he's looking for a David that will stand by his side until something happens and come on now David was saying I know there is water to drink up that's better than the water from the wells of Bethlehem I appreciate where I'm at I thank God for what he's done But I'm longing for something better Amen. The Bible said it is the Lord That both worketh in us to do And to will to do his good pleasure Amen. So at this supper Everybody looked the same So at the end of the revival For however long it lasts At the end of the revival Brother Rocap and I We'll make a mental checklist or a physical checklist and say how many were saved, how many were sanctified, how many were Holy Ghost filled. And then we look back and say, hey, he's a gentleman. Obviously, they wanted it. Obviously, they who wanted it. Do you know why Judas went out? It wasn't because Jesus' sayings were hard. It wasn't because the Passover supper wasn't proper. It wasn't because the preaching wasn't gun barrel straight. It wasn't because Jesus wasn't being serious with them or showing his love and affection. In fact, Judas said, I have betrayed an innocent man. Come on now. He wasn't going out of the church pointing fingers at nobody, but I want you to know there is never an honorable situation when any person of God leaves the family of God that is a dishonor and that's going to hurt somebody it's going to hurt themselves more than it hurts anybody else come on now everybody in the building looks the same this morning but I don't know what's going on under the surface in every heart I don't know who's already on the job tomorrow I don't know who's already walked into the courtroom next week but I can tell who's in this service I can tell who's in this revival I can tell who's trying to get a drink from that golden pitcher John was a fisherman so were some of the others in the room John was the son of thunder so was his brother James it's apparent that James and Peter had God given leadership abilities because after they received the Holy Ghost they became leaders over these, uh, these very men and the New Testament church. But what stands out to me about John during my studies is that this man had the greatest desire to be with Jesus so he would be the one that liveth the longest. He would be the one that saw Jesus give the revelation there on the Isle of Patmos because he had a desire to get close to Jesus. And that's what Peter was saying. Hey, though all men forsake you, I'll never forsake you. And Jesus said, you don't even realize your heart now. I'm praying for you that your faith don't fail you not. You're going to fail me. And whenever you remember how you failed me, you better go out and weep bitterly and come back to me. I see an increase in Peter's desire after a true repentance and a true turn 
journey. Come, come on, y'all getting what I'm saying? Oh, Peter was all mouth uh, and no action. But John, we find at one point that John kind of followed them to uh, Pilate's Hall at a distance. Uh, but he was not a far off. He just serving God, walking alongside Jesus uh, at a guilty distance, far enough away that he felt guilty. Isn't that something that they can apprehend, uh, apprehend, apprehend Jesus uh, and be walking away with him uh, and all the other followers of Christ uh, have fled to their houses uh, and they're hiding behind closed doors. Uh, but this very John, uh, he's a walking and looking. Uh, is that not what the Bible said, Brother Road Cap? Uh, he's trying to look. Uh, he's keeping his eye. You know what he's thinking? Uh, if I could just get closer, uh, if I could just lay my head uh, on his bosom again, uh, I want you to know what uh, no matter what uh, is going on with Jesus, uh, if he's healing the sick uh, or raising the dead uh, or in a tomb, uh, you will try to get to Jesus. Uh, and that's the desire uh, of John. Uh, I will go with him uh, through the garden. Uh, I will go with him uh, outside of Pilate's hall. Uh, I will go with him through Gethsemane. Amen. I'll go with him through that. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Desire. I'm dealing with a desire. The golden picture. You don't see the value of that golden picture. I didn't bring one this morning, but that'll work. You don't see the value of the golden picture. John wanted to keep his hands on the golden picture. The people didn't see the value of the golden picture. But John got a grip on it. I looked up the definition of that word grip, and it's an act of holding something or somebody tightly. John was walking around with the picture. Now, Brother Jesse, that sounds to me like church people saying, can I have a moment with the pastor? Hey, can I have a moment with this one? Can I, can I have a moment in that altar? Can I have a moment that somebody has clung to it? Somebody's got a grip on it, and I'm telling you, they're not going to let it go. It's like whatever you go to grandma's house and you want some sweet tea and your, your cousin's walking around with a picture what you're saying is if you'll take your hand off of that picture I'd like to put it in mine and pour me a little bit of it now we ought to be more concerned about the picture than we are the water because I'm going to tell you that Jesus is the picture that that living water blows out of that's why I've told people before you've got to fall in love with Jesus before you get the Holy Ghost. You've got to love Him more than you love anybody else. You've got to cling to Him. You've got to hold on to Him. I'll preach it to us this morning. Yeah. Preacher, why am I not getting the same blessing, the same promise? Now, Sister Wooten's wet through this entire sermon. Some of you said amen through this entire sermon. I want to know who is saying, I realize pastor is showing me, teaching me, preaching to me on how I can get closer to God and how I can walk away too through this revival saying, I got satisfied. You see, John, he may not have had the leadership abilities of James. I remember that... James and John's mother, the wife of Zebedee, said, put my boy on the left and put my other boy on the right. I've never heard anybody tie this together. In fact, it's tied together right now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And so here it is, left seat, Jacob, right, and right seat, and the mama. So apparently, Brother Nathaniel, he's leaning on her bosom. He, I know Jesus' bosom on his chest. Obviously, John's already got the left seat. She said, put James in the right seat. James is going to be in the command center. James is going to be the leader of the church but uh, you won't find that James was in love with God and James was quite the person there's two different Jameses that are apostles both of them became great mighty men of God but the Bible tells us a lot of times where John was trying to get as close to Jesus uh, as he can it's good to be in proximity where the preachers preaching I love it when we have a tent meet we're going to be having one soon this coming fall right over there in Pine Forest I love it when a half mile away or a mile away uh, I can hear the preacher 
teacher when I was a little boy. I would go outside there in Bradley Junction and sit on top of Papa's old chicken coop. And I'd listen to the black preacher over there across the corners preaching. And it would bless my soul. It's so good to hear that, isn't it? But when you're coming to church like you did last night, Brother Gabriel, and you realize Jesus is already in the house, the preacher is preaching, and the Spirit of God is blessing. I said, the Spirit of God is moving, and those that desire Him ain't sitting on top of a chicken coop. They're up there around the altar, praising the Lord. Everybody looks the same at this supper. They have God-given abilities, talents. They're chosen. But John has a desire to get as close as he possibly can. One inch. One inch. His desire is, I want to tap that fountain to live in water. Right? I'm a son. He's right here. It ain't no homosexual move. It ain't no homosexual gesture. I believe he's turning his ear to... He realizes inside of this eternal being. He focused in his gospel. In the beginning was the word. He said, that's my Savior I've been sitting by. He's creator. He's not just a 30-year-old man walking around performing miracles. He starts out saying, in the beginning was the word. And mine that I've been sitting by, he was God. And the word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And by the way, He's the creator. He's not somebody that hung like a dense rag up on a cross. He is the Lord of glory. And that's why his gospel is not a synoptic gospel. He's taken us through the very existence of the being of God, the deity of God. Oh, I feel like preaching to you this morning. So we see John is looking through different glasses than you and I are looking through sometimes. Brother Samuel, put on them reading glasses. See if he looks like my son. Brother Jesse, put on them reading glasses. See if he looks like my son. So we've got two goofy guys looking at one another. And look at that. Hey, are you probably are noticing you can't see as good. You probably can't even focus on Brother Samuel, can you? Brother Samuel, can you focus on me right now? As I preach, he said, I can barely make you out because those are level 1.5 reading glasses. You don't need them, but take them off. Hey, you can see me now, can't you? I'm telling you, people. People come to church uh, and they're looking through the wrong glasses. Uh, they don't see the preacher like they ought to see him. Uh, they don't see the singers uh, as they ought to see them. Uh, they don't see the brothers and sisters uh, as they ought to see them. It is not somebody to fuss and fight with. Uh, it is not somebody to be jealous with. Uh, it is somebody to be proud uh, of standing nearby. Uh, I'm proud uh, to sit by my brother. I'm proud uh, to sit by my sister. I am not uh, Ashamed of Jesus, and I'm not ashamed. Amen. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. To me, this is a beautiful thing. Now, Brother Nathaniel will be preaching tonight. And if this sermon could be the catalyst to you acting upon something tonight, if this will be the catalyst that will help you pray before church tonight instead of play. And realize, yes, our pastor will be there. The saints of God will be there. But your focus ought to be Jesus will be there. I'm going to cling to the golden picture. I'm going to cling to the golden picture. I'm going to hold to Jesus. Uh, bring me that golden picture, Brother Jesse. Now, I feel like, Sister Wooten, that whenever John would get close uh, to Jesus, he could tell that there's strength in this man. There's something that should not be there that is there. There's something about this man. John could tell, right, Brother Philip? And so he's just taken and he deducted, this is uh, the Son of God. This is the Anointed One. And Brother Tyler, that's all it's going to take uh, is whenever you get to worship in Jesus uh, the way you ought to worship Him and get a desire to worship Him and a desire to be spiritual. You won't think about key lime pie or cheesecake, although I will when I'm not in His presence. Uh, do it as well. But you will start faith. Yeah. Brother Tyler, is that all right? Is that offensive? You will start thinking about Him 24 hours a day. I woke up this morning, the first thing, right off, thinking about it, thinking about it. So in his search, 
John is obviously looking for satisfaction, just like every person in this building is. And Judas went down the wrong trail. He did. He didn't run well. He went down the wrong trail and ended up off the rails. He went down the wrong trail and went off the rails. There's a lot of people say, I don't need to go to church. And they wonder what happens to their kids and their grandkids. You train them up. You bring them up in the way that they should go. You train them up. And so we feel like John in his search for satisfaction, John took the right path by staying close to Jesus and he ended up in the upper room and he lived his latter days filled with the Holy Ghost. For John, his purpose was living for Jesus. For Judas, his purpose was living for Judas. I'm living right now for Jesus. I'm not living for Jeremy. I'm pastoring this church right now for Jesus. I'm not pastoring it for charity. Right? I'm not pastoring this church for approval, affirmation, or applause. I'm not pastoring this church for a pension, a paycheck, or a parsonage, or a car payment. I am in this for Jesus, and that's what John had. He had pure motives. I want to get close to him. I want to lay my head on his chest. So I believe there are some here this morning who are attending these services and these revival services who simply enjoy the music and the singing. But Sister Wooten, I cannot wait until they start looking for something more. Amen. This morning I woke up to Sister Starrett leaving a beautiful text message and she said, Pastor, I'm sorry that I didn't reply to that last text. She said, I got my shout last night, something I've always wanted. One of the signs of that was she went home and went to bed. She didn't sit up all night with a void in her heart, miserable. One of, the, one of the things that we notice after we've been in his presence, we can lay down and go to sleep because that void, we've been satisfied. We're not in search of something else. I knew right then the fact that she didn't answer by 11 o'clock that there was something. Brother Sterrett and I, we used to have a group text that she's in. I sent them a text. I knew right then they had had church. They had had church. Somebody had taken that golden pitcher in their hand and that living water got to run it. I'll tell you, last night we were praying for some of these over here that were seeking the Holy Ghost. And I said, God, we church them as much as we can church them. This is what I said the night Brother Jesse got the Holy Ghost. I said, I preach to them as much as I can preach. I've got as spiritual as a man can get. I've been sore for seven days at times from preaching hard twice on Sunday. I said, I put everything I have in it to move them. And I said, God, I know that I planted. I know that some have watered. And I'm asking you to give the increase. It wasn't but a little a while later, Jesse's in the floor filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what I said last night. I said, God, what I need is a river, a river of living water to pour out of the bellies of each and every one that does not have the Holy Ghost. Those that are not satisfied, we need a river. We need a river. Sister Luke, one of them was your grandson. He's praying right there. I said, God, I've been preaching to him for 17 years. I pointed right there at his belly. I said, God, we need a river. We need a river. We need a river. I pointed to somebody else. That's what happened to you. That's what changed you, Brother Jonathan. That's what changed you, Brother Philip. Brother Philip said before he got the Holy Ghost. Uh, in fact, I think the very night uh, he got the Holy Ghost, he noticed that there was a desire present. Uh, if you're a child of God, the fact that God uh, is working in you both to will and do of his good pleasure, that's nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, you didn't have that desire six weeks ago. Why do you got it now? Because it's God uh, working in you. I said, it's God uh, working in you. Hey, hey man, I'm telling you, uh, Brother Philip said he stood uh, in the upper part of my house and looked out the window and said, God, uh, I want the fullness of the Spirit. Uh, God, uh, I need the Holy Ghost. Before he went to church, he was looking out that bedroom window saying, where is the golden pitcher? Where is the golden pitcher? You don't have to wait till when my soul is basking in the presence of the Lord. I'll be satisfied. You can be satisfied. Sister Sterrett said, now I lay me down and slept. I wasn't worried about who's going to keep my soul. Because I had complete, total 
victory. She got carried into another realm of the Holy Ghost. And this is what Jesus was promising. He said, Judas ain't worried about being satisfied. He's worried about satisfying himself. Come on now, I felt it last night before I walked into my office. There's some unsatisfied hunger here. There's some insatiable desires here. And I want you to know you can feel the same thing that John felt prior to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. You can have a desire to go to the upper room and you can walk out filled. Matthew 5 and 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at the righteousness, for they shall be filled. Definitely the Holy Ghost is righteous. John chapter number 7 and verse number 37. Since it's Sunday morning, moving on quickly, the Bible said, In the last day, that great day. Do y'all remember me telling y'all put an emphasis on that? In the last day, that great day, the last day of the feast, finally Jesus stood up. And he started crying loudly. Does it matter how loud you get? Oh, yes. What about that shout? How could there be anything to that shout? Jesus stood up and he cried saying, If any man thirst, let him call unto me. Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now get this. Right here, this is the feast of time. Tabernacles. It's not the other three. This is a certain feast that you don't read much about in the Bible, but it's actually the biggest, most celebrated feast. And here it is. It's set aside. Why? Why is it set aside like John's Gospel? Why is this feast set aside? Because it's the feast of tabernacles when every Jewish male will come to Jerusalem and gather there at the temple and they will sing the praises of God. And they got one thing in mind. I will thank him for the harvest. I will thank him for being Jehovah Jireh. I will thank him for the provision of my family. And while they're celebrating, when the anointing comes down, the priest, he'll take a golden picture. And he'll go over there to the pool of Siloam. It's the same pool that the blind man washed his eyes in. And he'll dip up that water. Why did the blind man have to wash in the pool of Siloam? Because Jesus was going to show them later I am that living water I said he said I am that living water get this I'm going too fast for you that priest will walk to that well the pool of Siloam and he'll take that golden picture and he'll get some water and then he'll go over into the temple and he'll pour out of that golden pitcher into a silver bowl. And while he's pouring into that silver bowl, y'all ain't getting this. He starts praying, let it rain, Jehovah Jireh. Let it rain, Jehovah Jireh. And Jesus is sitting there in the church. He's sitting there. And the Bible said in the first verse of that seventh chapter that Jesus' brethren were trying to get him to go to the circus. You say, wait a minute, I thought they were in church. It was a circus. Jesus' brother is trying to get him to go to church and the circus. And they said, if you go, you can do a miracle and prove that you're God. And Jesus said, you know, that's going to set me up. They hate me. They envy me without a cause. They don't want to hear what I'm saying. That's going to provoke them to anger. And Jesus acted like Brother Tyler. He wasn't even going to go to the feast because his life would be in jeopardy. His health would be at risk. But now we find that Jesus went to church secretly. He's in that crowd and the priest is doing what the priest is supposed to be doing, being religious. And Jesus gets a belly full of it and realizes there's all these religious people that's got voids in their life. They're tired of hiking all the way up here with their family and going home empty. They're celebrating praising God for bread. I preached last Sunday morning on what where there's no biscuits. Hey, they sitting there celebrating the Lord of the harvest. They're celebrating the bountiful blessings of the Lord. And Jesus just can't take it no more. And he stands up and he cries. He says, all of you that are here that travel from far and wide to be here, I am the living water. Oh, thank God. I'm telling you, you come to the Bible night after night. And you need to realize he is the living water that comes out of the golden picture. While they're asking for rain, 
he'll give us a river. What do you want? A rain or a river? A rain or a river? Let it rain. Let it rain, Jehovah Jireh. And Jehovah Jireh is sitting right there. And he stands up and says, you want a rain? You fix it to get a river. Some of you have been praying and said, if I could just get a touch of what Brother Jesse got. Just let it rain on my soul. That's not what God's going to do for you, sir. I ain't seen him halfway filled anyway. He's going to give you a river. You can get the Holy Ghost right now. You can walk out of here saying, I believe on him. That's what Jesus said. The next thing he said before he sat down, he said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture said, as David said, as Isaiah said, as Ezekiel said, out of that belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, I'm telling you, I prayed last night. I said, God, these guys don't need rain. They need a river. And the Lord has put a river inside of some of them. And the Lord desires this morning to say, Satisfy every person in this building. He doesn't want one of us to have to live begging for rain. He wants every one of us to live with a river in our soul. This is a very thirsty world. They are attempting to satisfy the void in all the wrong ways. They're doing some of the very th various things that Judas did, and it will not work out for them the same way it did not work out for Judas. The setting and the context of our text is Jesus and his disciples are in church. And Brother Stared, I'll skip all this right here. And Jesus is saying, I know what you need. I know what you want. And then he says, you're going to get what you want. Let's stand right here. We have had several uprisings of the Holy Ghost already in this service. Those that already have the river in their soul, you've seen the floodgates open up and the river has flowed out of the temple. There's some right now still begging for rain. You need to start asking for a river. Sister Starrett got caught up in that river last night. It says many heard him when he cried out. And when he cried out, here's what they said. Brother Chris, they were all sitting around. And they said, there ain't no doubt that guy we've been debating about that we didn't think was here, he's here. And here's what they said, Jesse. Some of them said he's definitely Christ. Some of them said he's definitely a great prophet. What they were saying is, I felt that. Did you feel that? I felt that. Did you feel that? Thousands of people gathered there and he stood up, cried out the lion of the tribe of Judah, screamed and said, I am the Lord. That's who said he was going to send these waves of revival to the Bethel Holiness Church. Brother Samuel, you ain't getting the rain. All of you that have received the Holy Ghost, y'all aren't getting rains. Y'all got rivers in there. And every now and then the dam opens up and you feel it flow and you say, I don't know where it's coming from, but it's coming from within. And you say, how can so much power and so much force be inside of me? That's what Jesus said, I will be inside. And I will satisfy the thirsty. And I will satisfy the hungry. And you know what? The living water's coming out of that child of God's bodily temple. Who is thirsty this morning? You know what you need to look for? A satisfying relationship. A satisfying relationship. That's why I needed spiritual people to pray. And Brother Jesse said, I realize he's not asking for religious people. He's not asking for a good son to pray. He's not asking for a church pianist to pray. He's not asking for somebody that never misses a service to pray. Because of the grave need, he needs spiritual people. So what pastor was saying, I need people with the river. I need people that's clinging to the pitcher. I need people that's holding to the pitcher. The golden pitcher. David said, my soul thirsted for thee. I need a satisfying relationship. John did not lack desire. David did not lack desire.
Isaiah did not lack desire. The Lord spoke through Isaiah and said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Brother Caleb, the river, come from within in a hotel room because of a young man getting down on his knees and praying for his daddy who was fixing to preach to Law's family. Brother Jesse, the river, came forth from within a church pianist who realized I'm not spiritual. Brother Philip, the river came forth from within for a church drummer that realized I must have a burden for others. Sister Candace, the river came forth from within for a woman that hadn't really been raised at Pentecost but said, I love her so much, I'll hand her an express pass. And she'll get something she won't even understand, but one thing she'll say is, I know it's a river. Sister Wanda, the river came forth. She had the Holy Ghost already, but I'm talking about now. She said, I got more than a rain. Every couple months, now I got a river. Brother Jonathan, a river came from within while we're outside praying. And your mama's crawling on her hands and knees over there into the darkness. God help my troubled boy. He's behind me. I was praying for those that had just got the Holy Ghost. And suddenly, Brother Samuel, his body seemed to have been thrown in the air. Hit the ground and rolled for about 30 feet. The river got in there. The currents of the river. You've been asking for rain. I'm telling you what you need is a relationship. And that relationship will lead to a river. The golden pitcher. You have to fall in love with Jesus. Let's move into these altars. If we'll move right now, kneel down. There's a time to stand. There's a time. I want you to get real serious and just love on him and say, I need to get as close as I can. And I'm asking you to increase my appetite, increase my thirst, increase my desire. Rivers of living water from the golden pitcher flowing from within us. No music this morning, just all of us asking God to increase our desire. Narcotics will not satisfy. Fame, fortune, popularity will not satisfy that void. We need a river. Jesus told his brothers... It's not my time to go to the feast because my time hasn't came yet. But when Jesus stood up and he cried out, his time had came. In essence, Jesus was saying, my time has come. My time has come. I need a river. Flowing from the golden pitcher. Increase my desire, Lord, where my thoughts are on you continually. Day and night. My desires toward you. My heart has shifted. My heart has shifted. My dreams have changed. Ask him to help you with desire, desire, desire. So rich. 
It's so full. It's so satisfying. I love him so. I love him so much. I love him. How about it? Draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. Your desire should be towards him. Right now, focus on Jesus. Get your hands on the golden pitcher. Get your hands on the golden pitcher. Let's take our minds off of everybody else and put them on Jesus right now. Can we do that? More than wealth, fame, or desire. More than all. More than all the world's attire. I need to make it. I need to love him. I need to desire him. Our comments won't fix it. Fame won't fix it. Popularity won't fix it, Judas. Judas, popularity and fame won't fix it. Fortune won't fix it, Judas. Jesus can. Only Jesus can satisfy the soul. I feel it right here this morning. Lord, give me a desire. Give me a desire.